वसुदेवसुत देव कंसचाणूरमर्दनम देवकी परमानंदम कृष्ण वंदे जगद्गु we are studying the fourth chapter now of the bhagavad gita and there we came across the most interesting verse which is one of the paradoxical verses and very important as far as advaita vedanta is concerned and we saw that karmanya ka karma ya pashyet one who sees the, there is no action in the midst of all activity akarmani cha karmaya and where apparently there is no action that one one who sees that there is actually action sa buddhiman this is the wise one this is the enlightened one among all human beings manushyeshu sa yukta this is the one centered in yoga centered in self knowledge krishna sa krishna karma kre the this is a person who has accomplished the goals of life and we uh, explain what it meant and then sri krishna goes on to show how one can live this in day to day life not only enlightenment but after enlightenment post enlightenment how does the enlightened person carry over that enlightenment that wisdom into day to day life does that person have to become a monk and uh, you know um, uh, you know renounce all activity go off into the mountains or can that person remain engaged in activity if that person remains engaged in activity how is that person different from the un, uh, unenlightened person and what can we even before enlightenment what can we learn from all of this and apply it in our own lives so how to spiritualize our day to day life what is enlightenment that becomes clear by by looking at that verse 18th verse through the paradoxical language he points to the advaitic truth and then how to apply it in our life so we were looking at that last time the basic idea is this look at it at three levels at the level of the self at the level of the mind and at the level of the body what krishna is saying is that at the level of the self um the enlightened person sees that there is no action i am pure consciousness awareness existence consciousness bliss uh, there can be no possibility of action action implies change there is no change there uh, increase or decrease getting something that is not yet attained action implies a person there is somebody who is an agent of action action implies that there are instruments of action and some object to be attained by action none of which are possible in the absolute where there is only infinite being existence bliss uh, existence consciousness bliss so at the level of the self atma real self no action is there nor is it possible nor is it necessary action is not necessary so the the uh, all the questions of the world do not arise there that's one for the enlightened person for the unenlightened person there is activity at the level of the self because for the unenlightened person before we realize you know chidananda rupa shivoham i am of the nature of shiva i am shiva before we realize that we firmly feel we are this person i am this person sarva priyananda i am this i can point out who i am here this fellow this body and the person inside this is my idea of self so at that level is there action of course goes without saying for the unenlightened person at the level of the self there is action i am the doer of all actions i do action and i i can restrain myself from doing actions and krishna has said in both cases you are involved with karma you are the doer or of actions or the doer of not doing actions then at the level of the mind at the level of the mind um the unenlightened person does action for fulfillment i get involved in life i try to get money and relationships and objects and maintain my physical health and um, have a series of pleasant experiences all of these i do for fulfillment and all of these in- include this involves action all karma i do in the hope of getting fulfillment peace satisfaction unenlightened person at the level of the mind psychological level psychological level the enlightened person does not do any activity for fulfillment because the enlightened person is already fulfilled does not require anything from the world so from the psychological level enlightened person acts out of fulfillment from fulfillment um, as a manifestation of the divinity within in swami vivekananda's language for loka sangraha welfare of the world in sri krishna's language out of compassion uh, in buddha's language out of love 
in um, uh, Jesus' language. So, the enlightened person, psychologically speaking, is quite different. The action, the, the activities of the enlightened person are quite different, psychologically speaking, at the level of the mind, psychologically, compared to the unenlightened person. Then at the level of the body, at the level of the body, an enlightened person is acting, all kinds of activities are going on, and an enlightened person is also acting, all kinds of activities are going on. So, at three levels, consider at three levels, physical level, bodily level, you will see um, the unenlightened person is also acting, and um, Buddha and Shankaracharya and Vivekananda and, uh, and Krishna, they are all acting, they are acting means do, doing work, they are involved in activities, involved in life, it is going on. Even someone like Ramana Maharshi or like Tota Puri or so, who is withdrawn, even then, some physical activity is there. The person is walking around, talking, going for, begging for food at least. So that much is there. So physical level activity is there for enlightened person and unenlightened person. Psychological level, enlightened person acts out of fulfillment, out of complete happiness and peace for out of love, out of compassion, out of uh, the desire for the welfare of everybody. Uh, so that's why the, un un the enlightened person acts. The unenlightened person acts in order to get fulfillment, in order to satisfy desires. And at the level of the self, the enlightened person is quite clear because the enlightened person is no longer a person, knows that I am not this person, I am this infinite awareness. That level there is no action possible. Pure consciousness does not act. And the unenlightened person acts even at the level of the self. The unenlightened person thinks, I am this body and mind. I am this person. And of course I am doing all sorts of activities. I am involved in karma. To put it in a nutshell, though involved in karma, the enlightened person is not bound by the law of karma. And the unenlightened person, whether trying to do activities or trying to withdraw from activities is fully bound in the law of karma. That's it. Now, what about the question of becoming a monk or being a householder, withdrawing from activity or engaging in activity? Krishna says in both cases, enlightened person can be, a householder can be enlightened person, a monk can be enlightened person. Uh, activities can go on in the case of the householder. Uh, and can go on in the case of the monk also. Or one can, after enlightenment, one can continue with activities or one may withdraw from most of the ordinary activities of life. One can become a, a complete hermit, you know, like a wandering monk like Totapuri. All these are possible. And those ones he is going to talk about. Enlightened householder. What is the spiritual life of an enlightened householder? The, how, how the enlightened householder goes about the business of life. Then next, the enlightened monk. How does this person go about the business of life and day-to-day -day activities? These two we will see now. Verse number 20. Enlightened but a householder. Enlightened but involved in all activities. How? 20. Tyaktva karma phala sangam nitya tripto nirashraya karmanya bhi pravritto bhi naiva kinchit karoti sa. Verse number 20. Renouncing the attachment for action and its fruits, ever contented, without any refuge, he does not do anything even though engaged in action. So there, here Krishna is referring to a person who is fully involved in the business of life, a householder, someone like Arjuna, someone like Krishna himself. So what does this person do? First of all, Nitya Tripto. Uh, tripta means satisfied. Nitya ever, ever satisfied. Not sometimes satisfied. Or like most of us, never satisfied. So there is difference between enlightened and un unenlightened. Un -enlight unenlightened, never satisfied. An enlightened person, ever satisfied. So, this person is ever satisfied, ever content. Why? How? Because of self-realization. I am this immortal awareness. I am not subject to birth and death. Birth and death are of the body only. Why should I be afraid of death? Even when the body dies, why should I be afraid of death? 
Krishna has already said in second chapter, it is just like changing a, a, a suit of clothes. So for the enlightened person, that is also the great fear of death is no fear at all. Then uh, what do I need? As a body, as a mind, we need, as a person, we need certain things because we are limited. This person is unlimited. Neither in time nor space, nothing limits the infinite self. There is nothing that is not the self also. Everything is included within the self. Everything is an appearance of the self. There is nothing that this person needs from the world. Nothing that the world can give the enlightened person. Of course, not a person. I keep saying person. The enlightened being the Jivan Mukta, the free while living. Nothing that the world can add uh, to, to uh, him or her. Nothing that it can subtract also. So, Nitya Tripta, ever satisfied. And because ever satisfied, there is no hankering, looking into the world outside for fulfillment. Remember Shankaracharya's, um, one of his favorite phrases, Avidya Kama Karma. Avidya Kama Karma. Ignorance, desire, karma. Ignorance of the self. So, because I do not know the rope, I see a snake. I do not know that I am the I am, I am the Atman, pure consciousness, and therefore I think I am this body and mind. The body and mind appears. The difference between enlightened person and non-enlightened person is this. The body and mind appears to both. But the un unenlightened person thinks, I am the body-mind. And that's it. The un enlightened person knows, either I am none of it, world, body, mind, none of it. These are all appearances in consciousness. Or I am all of it. So I'm not limited by the skin only. Inside the skin I am. Outside the skin other. No, that is unenlightened. So the enlightened person uh, is not subject to avidya. But unenlightened person, avidya, ignorance. Once ignorance is there, there will be superimposition. What is superimposition? Adhyasa. Taking oneself to be what one is not. Taking oneself to be body-mind. One is pure consciousness. But what do I think I am? Body-mind. Once I do that, then calm or desire will come. Why will desire come? Because as body-mind, I truly am limited. I am terribly dependent upon the world. Little COVID-19 can kill me. So I want what? Vaccine. COVID-19, then I want to um, survive as this body. I am afraid. I want um, not only food and clothing and shelter, but I want everything else that comes, whatever the world can show me. Everything seems attractive. More gadgets, uh, more possessions, more money, more people, more engagements. I feel I need all that to be happier and happier and happier. So that is the karma. And to get all that, I get involved in the world. That is karma. So once I am involved in the world, then the law of karma will come into play and I am caught in samsara. Dharmic karma will generate merit, punya. Adharm, adharmic karma will generate papa, demerit. And papa and punya will generate sukha dukha, pleasure and pain. And this cycle will go on and that is our lives. So that, that is the life of an unenlightened person. But this person is nitya tripta, ever satisfied because of self-knowledge. And therefore, nirashrayaha does not depend on, does not take refuge in the results of karma. I will get certain things, then only I will be happy. No. The happiness of that person is always there. So, does not depend upon external world. Does not depend upon sense objects. Does not depend upon people. I am lonely. If I have people around me, then only I am happy. Yeah. Or opposite, that I don't like people. So, I want to be by myself. I think it's Sarth who said, hell is other people. What is hell? Other people. <laughs> so, that also is a sign of ignorance. Because I think of myself as a person. An enlightened person is, is unresisting. Like the sky. The space. What, it gives space for everything. Whatever comes and goes. Space neither sticks to it when something goes away. Neither resists it. In fact, allows for all things to be. Pure consciousness is like that. Whatever appears in pure consciousness, uh, in, uh, in awareness itself, you don't resist it, nor do you stick to it. So same with people. Nirashtra, I am not dependent on the... If people come, well and good. 
if people don't are not there well and good um i i have mentioned the monk i met in the himalayas who is to live uh, all year round so when i met him uh, in the high mountains there his little hut he lived there were pilgrims at that time in summer children would come and play with him because he had a very long beard and they were fascinated by it and uh, so i asked him well now you are very happy there are so many people around but what happens in winter when there is nobody around and uh, the snow is knee deep literally knee deep you put your foot down uh, on, on the ground it goes all the way uh, almost up to your knees so deep and they are the monks are sort of they have their own community but that's they told me how just to you know for the com- little um, social contact and to make sure everybody is all right they get together once a week so it's a very interesting community there are about maybe 15 20 monks who stay over in that vast area in deep winter so it's all snow bound and so they get together and the place they get together is by turn um uh, each monk's hut or cave they will go and sit together and maybe talk a little bit they brew some tea and then uh, talk some more and then they disperse and they have flashlights so they were saying that very well, interesting how they uh, live there so they go back to their um huts or caves and from the mouth of the cave they have to give a signal with the flashlight like this which from a distance it can be seen from far away so that they know that each person is reached their cave or their um their hut now i asked him in deep winter when though nobody is around then aren't you lonely so he asked answered in punjabi it was a punjabi upper swami uh, he answered in hindi he said ab maje mein hu aur mahatma ji tab aur bhi maje mein rehta rehta hu i am very happy now and when there's nobody around i'm even happier so nirashaya no do not depend on uh, anybody one monk very early i joined he really liked me a lot and we talked but he said no one thing for certain here i am spending so much time with you talking with you and but know that when you're not in sight you're also out of mind i don't think about uh, anybody who's not, not present i'm i don't um, you know they're not attached in that way it may sound heartless but that's the way it is nirashaya i do not depend on anybody for my happiness if they do think of anybody it is for the welfare of those persons you often um, read about holy mother and others thinking about the welfare sri ramakrishna thinking about the welfare of others sri ramakrishna is thinking when will niranjan attain god realization it's then the gospel so they are always worried for the welfare of others that much so not dependent on person not dependent on the ups and downs of uh, stock market not dependent on name and fame therefore tyaktva karma phala sangam giving up all dependence on karma and the results of karma both are attachments results of karma we get attached we want things to go a certain way and we do not want things to go the other way and karma also um people are often people may say that oh i am not really doing it for the results of karma eh? not for the fruits of karma i just want to do the work for the sake of the work often it's it's not that easy often it's just because the person is uh, <laughs> cannot sit quietly it must be up and doing something or the other uh, a kind of busyness disease i remember one of the first times times i got a scolding from um, a senior monk in our order the, the the abbot of the monastery i was a new uh, i was a novice and i was in the monastery just for a few months um and then one day in the evening after evening prayers and meditation i went to the office and i was doing some work so the abbot of the monastery the head from his from his room he could see the lights on in the office in the ashram office so he called me and he said uh, he found out who was there in the office he called me what were you doing in the office i said uh, i had this work or that work something and he said no after meditation go to your room you can study or meditate or sleep you can even sleep if you like but don't come out of your room until the bell for the night meal rings now what does that mean to prevent that busyness disease 
uh, you know, we might convince ourselves, I'm doing some work, some useful work. No, it's a trick that the mind plays to keep you in, engaged in some kind of activity or the other. That's dependence on activity. Dependence on activity. I knew a monk who was one of the most dynamic persons I, I ever knew. Uh, so he's passed away now, so I can say that. Uh, he, but, but the curious thing about him, he was hard at work from 4 a.m. in the morning till 11 in the night. He told the head of the monastery, you can count on me, Swami, anytime you want, anything. You call on me from 4 o'clock in the morning till 11 o'clock in the night. But the downside was, whenever this monk sat down for meditation, when we saw snoring emerging from him, he would fall asleep within minutes. So this is dependence on karma, on activity. One should not depend on that also. One very senior monk said that he had been advised um, when he joined the order that develop the habit of reading. There will come a time when you cannot do work or there isn't anything to be done. So, develop the habit of reading. And then he said, develop the habit of japa. There may come a, come a time when you cannot even read. Maybe you are too old and uh, sick to read. So develop the habit of repeating the mantra. The habit means you are comfortable doing that and fully engaged in doing that. I have seen monks, a few at least, all day long the mantra that is going on. They are fully engaged in that. We might find it boring to repeat a mantra for hours and hours. They don't. They are full of joy and they are focused there. But it takes discipline, cultivation. Taktva karma phala sangam Not attached to the work, or the results of work. Why not attached? Because they do not depend on it for satisfaction. Why don't they depend on it for satisfaction? Because their satisfaction is from this um, self-knowledge, the realization that I am the infinite. After this, such a person, karmanya vipravritto api, although fully engaged in action. So that's why it is said, that's why I am saying this verse is meant for the householder, enlightened householder, the enlightened person of action. After all this, karmani avipravritta. Uh, what kind of karma? Will this person go around giving lectures on Vedanta? May or may not. This person may be engaged in just the karma that is to be done. So in Arjuna's case, it may just be the duty that is to be done. Or he can continue to be a warrior or a prince and an administrator. Um, a teacher can continue to be a teacher. An engineer or a doctor can continue to be an engineer or a doctor. A parent and a housewife can continue to be a parent and a housewife. And there are numerous such examples given in the Puranas, in the Mahabharata and all, of people, uh, men and women, who are enlightened in the most humble uh, occupations in life. Karmani avipravritto. Or, it could be on the other, other end of the scale, could be engaged in enormous activity, like the Buddha or Krishna or Shankaracharya or Vivekananda, for the welfare of humanity, for the uplift of humanity. Could be. But the point is, they are fully engaged in activity and yet very different from the unenlightened. Such a person, naiva kinchit karoti sa, such a person can honestly say, I do not do anything. I do not do anything. Why? I, the pure consciousness, do not do anything in the midst of intense activity. I, the mind of the enlightened person, do not depend on these activities for uh, my satisfaction, psychological level. Bodily level, Intense activity. Who was more active than the Holy Mother? Masharada Devi. See, the activity does not have to be the glamorous activity of spreading spirituality across the world or, or uh, you know, awakening the nation like Swami Vivekananda. It could be as simple as cooking and cleaning the hut and uh, consoling people and um, looking after a diseased person, a, a sick person, a mentally ill person and so on. That's what the Holy Mother did for years and years and years. The most ordinary, quotidian, boring kind of work. And she was never bored. She said, Dukho ki jani ne babu. I do not know what sorrow is. <laughs> what an amazing statement. A very simple statement. I do not know what sorrow is. So this is the enlightened householder. Does one have to be engaged in action? Can't one be an enlightened monk? Yes, of course. That's the next verse. 
one may not do anything and can one may entirely withdraw from activity verse number 21 nirashiryata cittatma tyakta sarva parigraha shariram kevalam karma kurvan apnoti kalbisham bereft of desire controlled in mind and body with all possessions relinquished and doing merely bodily action he does not get tainted so this person is also beyond the law of karma who is this person it's the enlightened person but a monk um this monk what does this person do no activities as such household activities um, occupation career nothing any social activities nothing so shariram kevalam karma only activities pertaining to the maintenance of the body may go for so i've seen many such monks i mean i don't know if they are enlightened or not but the this pattern of life um they may go for a meal a day or once or twice a day some uh, they beg for their food and they come back to their hut or their cave and that's it that's their only engagement with society maybe some of them they teach uh, maybe some of them they wander around from place to place they're staying at no place more than 3 days 3 nights and um, some of them they teach the people they come across anybody asks for advice or or maybe they have a round they go from village to village town to town and there are groups of devotees who await their arrival and they have classes and they teach or maybe they don't maybe they don't there are many such even now i know of one monk <laughs> who has this um, policy of zero zero he he i think he is naked or just wears a loin cloth and lives literally lives under a tree literally lives under a tree very child like his policy is zero 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 means he starts the day with zero possessions nothing but there are lots of people who come throughout the day they bring food and clothes and money and it is being continuously given away the rule is by sunset everything must have been given away it must be zero again so it's zero 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 uh, so like a daily audit is done uh, the books are balanced at the beginning of sunrise and sunset uh, and all day long uh, people come to him for blessings he teaches very radical kind of advaita vedanta but also very affectionate that's one there are monks who have a minimum minimal uh, possessions i have seen if you staying in the mountains in there you need um a little bit of food a little storehouse where you keep basic minimum food and fuel maybe medicines maybe uh, a change of clothes and warm clothes and stuff like that firewood so whatever it is shariram kevalam karma only the activities of the body and the rest of the time could be devoted to teaching or to remaining uh, engaged in meditation so for example after uh, experiencing nirvikalpa samadhi narendranath vivekananda ramakrishna asked him what do you want to do now and he said i want to remain like this once in a while i might come down from that state and eat a little bit but i want to remain like this of course ramakrishna scolded him as a result of which we are here today but um what he asked for was a very traditional kind of spiritual life the acme of that you remain absorbed in god what's wrong with that nothing it's wonderful it it's the peak of uh, and and when vivekananda said such people they are also the blessings to society just their very existence they they, they testify to the truth of religion that it can be done and their very existence is a blessing to um, the society in which they say uh, in which they are so shariram kevalam karma only work pertaining to the maintenance of the body that's it and uh, who are these people tyakta sarva parigraha who have given up all kinds of possessions so this is the by this is indicated a monk they have given up money so monk should have no money um, should have no uh, property and um, should have um, no Uh, you know family or special relatives like uh, for the monk everybody is equal so no wife or husband or children um, either they did not get married or get into family life or they were people who have gone through family life and then they have come out of it like the buddha for example so no relatives everybody is the same to this person and equally distant from this person um no duties 
So it was well understood in, in India that um, where duty lies heavy upon a person, what you're supposed to do in life, the one way of escaping from all your duties is to become a monk. Then society, very happily uh, and with great prestige, lets you off from all duties. So you, are, you don't have family duties, you don't have economic duties, you don't have social duties, national duties. You're probably, if the only duty is to be a good monk, to become enlightened, that's it. And this was given great pre um, prestige in India, even till today. And not just in Hinduism, in Buddhism, in Jainism, many, many orders of monks and who are highly regarded. Um, some of these monks are very literally so. Uh, you know, these Jain monks are very, very, very austere. Uh, some of them, so they eat only once a day, of course. And so we shave, for example. And uh, so there is no particular rule, but generally we shave. And these Jain monks also, they are shaven, but they, are sh the, they have to pluck out the individual hairs with the hand. Pluck, it, pluck them out. And with each hair plucked out, they have to shout, Ha, so come, ah, the joy of it. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm sure all, they all, all, all don't do it, but uh, this is one practice that's... Uh, so it just shows how austere they are. And there are many who do not take any kind of uh, vehicle. They always will walk. Many of them are barefoot. Uh, the Jain Digambaras are completely, they, can, they, cannot, they cannot even put on clothes. So um, this great teacher, I remember we invited him to give a talk at our Institute of Culture in Calcutta. And the teacher, Jain master, he lived in Rajasthan. And he wrote back, oh, you should have invited me six months ago. Why? Because I have to walk from, that's, he, he wants to, he has to walk across the breadth of India. Uh, he cannot take a, a plane uh, or a train or a bus or even a car. So, Tyattva Sarva Parigraha. So, why? What is the point of all of this? Just uh, a little indication about the point of a monastic life. See, people get married and education, money, peop um, children, all of these are supposed to give happiness and security. I have all of this. I have a house. I have money. I have people around me who will take care of me. I will take care of them and who are a source of joy for me. That's the idea at least. Practically what happens is a different story, but that's the idea. Now the monk does not depend on anybody or anything for happiness or security. For happiness, self-realization, and for security, self-realization as Atman, um, there is no need for any security. And as the body, the monk still has a body, you depend on God and depend on your karma. Whatever will, will happen, it will happen because of karma. I remember in, in the mountains once we were there, we used to go to this teacher every day for a class on Ashtavakra. So the teacher was a very old monk very non-dualistic. So one day there was a feast for monks. So you know there is a dish called Malpoa. This is a sweet dish. Um, so that was given, that was the hot news in the monastic grapevine that day in the, in the community that they had, everybody got Malpoa. In the class, the old Swami asked that, uh, so I heard there was Malpoa today. How many did you eat? So I said one, somebody said two, somebody said three. And uh, then the old Swami said, look, I didn't go, but they sent it for me. Now, you see, our karma brings to us whatever we deserve. It's like, he gave a very nice example, like the postman, the letters which are marked for you, addressed for you, the postman is supposed to deliver it to you. And so, karma will deliver whatever you deserve. Uh, I don't have to go anywhere. And if I get it well and good, it's come by my karma. If I need it, I will use it. If I don't, I, will, I won't use it. And if it doesn't come to me, well and good, because it's not my karma. So they don't de depend on people or money or anything else for security or for happiness. Nirashi, they do not depend on other things. That's why they can let go of everything. Having let go, what's the advantage? Imagine the amount of freedom and... Um, uh, you know, independence one gets. 
So if you have wife, husband, children, property, taxes, vehicle, uh, uh, gadgets, job, job. Imagine the amount of um, how you are tied down and how much responsibility there is for years and decades into your future. But if you have none of this, completely you have thrown all of the, the decks have been cleared for action. Imagine the freedom, the sheer lightness, as Swami Vivekananda put it very powerfully. Forgotten by the world, the world forgetting. Forgotten by the world, the world forgetting. See, we think that monks are there, they are not concerned about the world. No, it's what is faster is the world forgets about you faster. faster. You don't forget about the world so fast. The world goes on. The world is busy. So you have left your parents and your relatives behind. And those relatives, they have their li uh, lives. You, know? you have nephews and nieces and they grow up and they have got their own lives to lead. And so they might have this story in their family about this one boy who became a monk. And that's it. And they have their own busy lives. But this person who has left everything and gone up into the mountains, the person may still have traces. You, know? you may still remember the way it was. And so that's why Vivekananda says the world forgetting. Forgotten by the world already. And that's the state of being a monk. And um, it's great freedom. It's great lightness. So that time energy is now devoted to spiritual practice. Or in the case of the enlightened person is devoted to remaining absorbed in God. As Vivekananda said, I want to remain absorbed in Nirvikalpa Samadhi. Like Totapuri or Ramana Maharshi, completely absorbed in the divine. What it requires? Yata Chittatma. This is important. This is one distinction from everything else. Yata Chittatma means controlled in body and mind, disciplined in body and mind. Here notice the interesting use of the word Atma. Here Atma means body. We think Atma means the self, pure consciousness. And atma just means self. The body is also a self. The mind is also a self and the real self is of course the self, the Atma. So body can be called Atma, mind can be called Atma. In fact in the Upanishad it is so called. Uh, the Annamaya Atma, the food self, uh, the Pranamaya Atma, the vital self, the Manomaya Atma, the mental self. And finally, uh, finally you go to the real Atma, the pure consciousness. But here Atma means body and Chitta means mind. Disciplined, austere in body and mind. This is the precondition of a successful monastic life of this kind, what they are talking about. If I want, um, you see how dependent we become on the little conveniences and luxuries of life. So if I want bed tea in the morning when I get up, don't become a monk. So, <laughs> I remember once in the mountains, I was, we were there and I was sitting with this very austere old Swami. Two ladies came and they are obviously well-to-do families. You could see from their saris and everything. They were well-to-do. They were visiting. So they were asking the Swami, Swami, how do you live like this? I can't imagine not getting bed tea in the, in the morning. And the Swami just said, it's nothing to do with spirituality. It's just a matter of habit. It's a discipline you practice of body and mind. And it, you get used to it. Simple living, you get used to it. Anybody can get used to it. But it has to be practiced. You can't straight away jump from a very comfortable, luxurious life straight into the mountains or into the forests. What will happen then is, though your motivation may be good, what will happen is, because the body and mind are not disciplined and not used to that kind of a life, uh, they will kick up such a fuss, physically and mind especially. It will not allow you to do spiritual practice. So, that austerity, simple food, um, don't care too much about physical comfort. Could be too cold or too hot. Um, so, not af afraid of, you know, not scared or anxious. So, I was, it, it takes some getting used to. I was in this little hut and deep darkness all around. Once this evening falls and howling wind outside, cold, more, uh, Himalayan wind. No human being nearby uh, for... I won't say miles, at least some, some maybe, maybe a mile or two. And my only companion was there's a broken hut next door where a wolf used to live. So, <laughs> now, was I scared? Yes. So I would, of course, I could bar the door and I, I finally got a big stick from the forest. So I don't know who I would beat with the stick, but somehow that gave me a little bit of courage to keep that. 
and you would have to really screw up your courage to go to the bathroom at night. You need a flashlight and to open the door and you have to dress up against the uh, wind and uh, um, you know go out into the darkness outside. Anyway, so that austerity. You can't get your favorite foods, um, company, dependencies of many kinds. One Swami told me, after living for several months in Uttarkashi doing meditation, one day he went to a shop to have a cup of tea. And there, after six, seven months, for the first time in those days, this was the 1960s, he saw a man sitting in that village shop reading a newspaper, outdated old newspaper, two, three days old. And the Swami said, I could not stop myself from looking over his shoulder to take a look at the newspaper. You see, now in today's world, if you say, I can't stay away from my phone, then you're going to be in trouble. No Wi-Fi. So, <laughs> um, here I've seen in, um, I think, Washington Square or somewhere here, I saw homeless person. But sitting outside a general store because they have free Wi-Fi. So the person can use their device just sitting outside the store. If you're dependent on these things, then it'll be difficult. Yata Chittatma, um, disciplined, austere in body and mind. And there's so many such stories I could um, relate to you. Um, food. I've seen this monk who for his begging bowl... He would, it looked like a helmet. It doubled as a helmet. He would put his turban around it. And for when we go for food, he would take it out and have food in that and then wash it and put it on his head again. That was his only possession, except for one change of clothes. Um, one monk who lived in that hut before me, I didn't see him. Another monk in nearby told me, see the monk who lived, they talked about discipline. See, when you are alone, for example. So in the monastery, you get up in the morning because there are prayers and meditation. Others will be expecting you. There's a bell which is being rung. You can't avoid it. But if you are living by yourself, unless you are self-motivated, one can easily slip into, into laziness and just, just you know, uh, whiling away time. So somebody told me, see Swami, the monk who lived in your hut before you, years ago, uh, there was a Nepali monk who used to stay there. He would get up early in the morning just after sunrise, he would come outside and meditate. One day, he failed to get up. It was cold. It was always cold, but it was especially cold. And he said later that he snuggled up more into the, um, the blankets. In Hindi, they say rajai. The blankets are also particularly uninviting. They are scratchy and old and they are all older than me. And they are, I'm sure they were 40, 50, 60 years old. He crawled into that and slept and by the time he came out, it was already bright sunlight outside. He was so overcome by remorse, together with the blanket, he ran into the river and river, remember, that is the, uh, it's fast flowing, Gango tree, the water. And it's, the water is like knife, as cold as that. If it touches, it's like being cut with a knife, it's as cold. Just ice melt water. I know, because I used to bathe there, so I know. It's one of the most courageous things I've done is to pour that water over my head. This monk ran with the blanket, the, the, the blanket into the, the freezing stream and the water froze around the blanket and then he wrapped himself in that and he said, now enjoy. he's telling his body, enjoy it, enjoy it even more. So I think until he was rescued by others. So that, that kind of fierceness, determination, I've got so many monk stories to tell you. Um, Swami Turiyanandaji in Belur Mat. So, in the, so that was cold. This is the Belur Mat story is about heat. It's just the opposite. So um, very hot and sweaty. So there's a very beautiful sharbat which is prepared and offered to Sri Ramakrishna in the shrine, and. Uh, the prasad, that means the offered sharbat, is given each day to one monk. It, it's a tradition that still continues. So in summer, you look forward to that one day in the summer. In 60 days, it will come to you and you get that very nicely prepared sharbat. So it, the story is that it was bought to Swami Turiyan and the disciple of Sri Ramakrishna. This, Swami, this was offered to Sri Ramakrishna today in a shrine. And the Swami took one sip of it and he said, take it back. And he said, but didn't you like it? 
He said, I liked it, that's why. So, <laughs> so this is Yata Chittapma, controlled in um, body and mind. Another Swami told me the story of his guru. He stayed with his master and all the other disciples and his duty was to, um, the monks would go and beg for food and bring back food and they would sit for their classes and his duty was to collect the food, heat it up and then distribute and feed the monks after the classes. So one day he thought that the food was so tasteless. Um, so if I could just get a little bit of salt, it will be more tasty. Whatever they bring, I can add a little salt to it. So he went to his guru and asked for, at that time, um, a few paisa. I'll go to the village and the, imagine, the village is 26 kilometers away. Uh, I know, <laughs> that's a different story. Now, there, I'll go there and bring a little salt for you. And, I'll, and his guru scolded him so harshly. You want salt in your food? You, are become a, you have become a slave to your senses? And, uh, and scolded him and did not give him the money. And this Swami said, I was so hurt that I was doing it for them. In any case, I was doing it for them, not for myself. And with just a little bit of salt and just a few paise, that's all. Later, I discovered how my guru ate. When I would heat up the food and then give it to him, the different kinds of items, whatever was there, and to the other monks, I saw he would collect all the food and then put all of it into his water pot. <laughs> where it, the whole thing would be washed by Ganga water, devoid of any taste whatsoever. Then only he would eat it. So obviously, adding a pinch of salt is the heights of luxury, decadence for him. Yata chittatma. When you are like this, you can be very happy. Otherwise, I have seen in the high mountains, so people living like that, very soon they become bored. If you do not have an intense spiritual urge, if you are not centered, then what will happen is, after some time, I know it's the Himalayas, I know it's the Ganga, but it's just rocks and water and wind and loneliness and bitter cold. If it is, so here we don't understand now, we're, we've got, we're so well protected, even if there's so much cold, it's not as cold there in the mountains as it is here, in, suppose in New York, but we are protected, warm clothes and temperature control and things like that. There... If it is 30 degrees outside, it's 30 degrees in your hut. And your bed is also 30 degrees. And the temperature control is when you wrap yourself in a blanket, your body heat warms. The, the, that, that is the source of uh, heating. Yata um, Such a person, Shari Ram Kevalam Karma Kurvan Navnoti Kilbisha. Doing such work is not affected by the result. Kilbisha means dirt or sin. One point here that um, good karma gives merit and bad karma gives sin or demerit. This is what Kilbisha means. But here in the case of the enlightened person, both are regarded as, both are regarded as uh, stains or demerit or, or, or sin. Both good karma and bad karma because both keep you trapped in samsara. The difference is this. For a good person in society, unenlightened person, but a dharmic, religious, moral person, um, immoral action would be called kilbisha, the, the, that which pro produces stain, bad karma. So we would try to avoid this and do good karma. But for the enlightened person, uh, for, 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 the, for the spiritual person who wants freedom, both good and bad karma produce results which keep the person trapped in samsara. So both are called kilbisha. And this person um, who withdraws from all worldly activities does not uh, get the results of any kind of karma. Uh, so future karma is not generated. This person is already free. At the death of the body, there will be no rebirth. Now, again, back to the, to the next verse, 22nd. I'll just do this and stop. Uh, 22nd verse is, Shankaracharya interprets it for a, for a monk. But you will see it's a monk more like us, monks with activities in the world. So like monks with school and uh, college and relief activities and ashrams and all. Anyway, he takes it as a monk, but it can equally apply to a monk, a monk with uh, social activities going on uh, or a householder, but an enlightened person. 22nd. Yadrichalabhasantushto 
द्वंद्वातीतो विमत्सर Contented with what chance brings, transcending the pairs of opposites, free from jealousy and unperturbed in success and failure, is not bound even though performing actions. So when you read like something like, um, contented with whatever chance brings, um, you might feel, so he's talking about a monk in a mountain or a, you know, dependent on begging for food. But then when you read, unconcerned in the success or failure of his ventures, then it's not a monk who is uh, disconnected from society. It's somebody who is active in society and doing things in society. So you can take it either way. But basically it's a, an enlightened person. Yadritcha labha santushta. So totally satisfied with whatever his karma brings. Whatever comes by your own karma, you're satisfied with it. Satisfied with it means just because my karma has bought lots of things, so I'm going to um, pack my room or my hut or my cave with whatever the devotees have given. So I've seen a monk who couldn't live in his room because it was full of things his devotees had bought. So he had to live in a, on a on a bench outside, like a like a hard wooden bench. So that was funny. But no, it just means that I don't need anything more than that which comes readily by my my own praradha karma for a person engaged in action it does not mean fatalism it means being con- fully engaged in action and working hard but not dependent on the results of action for one's own personal satisfaction so consider a puja a worship of god so you do it do you do it um Okay, there are two ways of doing it. One worships God. If one wants something in life, then one does it very carefully so that God will bless me and I want money or success or something. That's a person who does worship with desire, sakama. But suppose, as spiritual seekers, we worship God, we do the ritualistic puja without any kind of desire. We don't want anything in a material sense. Just because we don't want anything in a material sense, do will I do it with a lackadaisical attitude, with a, you know, I don't care anyway. I don't, I'm not getting anything out of it. Let me just do it in whatever way. No. I do it with respect and love and all care. Similarly, all actions in life, whatever you are supposed to perform, whatever you are engaged in, have to be performed in that spirit as a worship of the divine. Um, but what comes to us finally is a result of my prarabdha. Is exactly what, or if you're devotional, is exactly what is given to me by the Lord. Everything here belongs to the Lord, including this body, including other people, including my possessions, my wealth, my name and fame. All of it belongs to the Lord. Not one bit of anything here belongs to me. This one must be absolutely clear. And therefore, we have no right to complain when things are taken away from us. So, yadricha lava santushta, with completely contented with what comes and with what goes. Dvandva tita vimatsara. Vimatsara means free of envy, free of jealousy, free of competition. So, you have taken this to this path of, path of enlightenment. Now, if you think, oh, I wish I had stayed in that job a little more, I could have earned another million. You know? No, don't do that. Once you have taken up, you are you have engaged in something much higher. You have left that behind you. You are contented with what has gone in your life, with what has been achieved and what has not been achieved. You are fine with that. Absolutely fine with that. That's maturity. You are not jealous or envious of others. Dvandva atita, transcending the pairs of opposites, heat and cold, pain and pleasure, uh, fame and dishonor, success and failure. Transcending means they will be there. Just because I am spiritual does not mean everything that I do will be successful. Just because I am spiritual does not mean that I will not get COVID. And no. All of that will can come or may not come. I should transcend. Even when those are there, good things and bad things, they are there. I am not unnecessarily excited and uplifted if things go my way. I am not unnecessarily depressed or unhappy if things do not go my way. I have seen this. Um... A monk I know 
who was uh, a disciple of Swami Vigyanananda Ji, a disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, Swami Vigyanananda, his birthday is coming up. Um, his disciple, I saw him in this monk's old age. He was paralyzed, both legs paralyzed, one arm paralyzed and blind in both eyes in his old age. Imagine, one of the happiest persons I've ever seen. How amazing it was to see this person. I first, for the first time I understood what is meant by transcending body consciousness. Transcending body consciousness does not mean you leave the body in a puff of smoke or something like that. No. Everything is there. The body is there. You are aware of everything. Uh, and it is sick. And one cannot go where one wants. One cannot get what one wants. The legs are not working. Hands are not working. And I am this old monk. I have no relatives. Nobody knows me. Nobody re visits me. Uh, I am just... I mean, that's a little excessive because people did visit him. But not the slightest self-pity. Not ever. Um, he could not see, so you had to announce yourself. That Swami, I am so and so. And the moment you announce yourself, he would ask about you, how you are doing, and full of blessings. He would bless you and all the people, you, wherever you have come from, which ashram you have come from, how are things going there. I remember in the hospital once we were there, uh, I was the youngest monastic patient and he was the oldest. He was, I think, in his late 80s probably. Evening. So we monks had this nice gossip session going. It was, we didn't notice. It was getting around 6 o'clock. It, it's not in the monastery. It's a hospital. So you don't, get, don't notice. 6, 6, 6.30. And the old Swami, what an internal clock he has. He's blind. He's in the corner. And he snaps from there. Monks, hush, time for prayer. <laughs> Aruti Shomai, Aruti Shomai. Uh, in Bengali he said, Ay Shadu, chup karo, Aruti Shomai. <laughs> he is aware that it is the time for meditation and, and for prayer. Okay. Dandwa Atita, one of the extraordinary cases of, being, of transcending the pairs of opposites. He is not concerned, he is not dependent on the world. For his happiness. He is not dependent on the, on the body for his happiness. Um, sama siddho siddho cha. Equal in success and failure. Now remember, so equal in success and failure means the worldly success and failure is of no uh, importance to this person. As long as this person is able to do the work as a worship of the divine for the welfare of the world, whether in a worldly sense the person has been successful or not, that is secondary. The unenlightened person's account of success and failure is, I want something out of this. If I get it, then I'm successful. If I don't get it, then I've failed. This person does not think in that way at all. This person is, does not want anything out of it. It just is work done with detachment as an expression of the person's feeling of oneness with the universe. Or if the person is a devotee, as an expression of love for God. And so it is always successful. It's always successful. In that sense. Sakritvapi, na nivadhyate. Even while doing action, such a person is not bound. Alright. Now we are going to in, uh, come to verse number 23 and 24 is the grand conclusion of this section. This particular section. Brahmarpanam Brahmahavi. That will be next time. Um... So, the 23rd verse also leads into the 24th. So, that's why I'm not touching it today. Let's me, let me look at the activity on the chat. How is this different from being a Stitha Pragya? No, no different. This is, we are talking about the enlightened person. Stitha Pragya. And you have got Dr. Long's review of Ayan Maharaj's book. So, you can download. Those who are interested, you can download from here. The Jivan Mukta is ever satisfied and therefore has no desire, but isn't acting in a moral or ethical sense for the welfare of the world also a desire? What is the difference? Yes, in that sense, but the difference is, desire is, remember, avidya kama karma, ignorance, desire, action. I am not aware of my true nature and therefore I feel unfulfilled and then I, now I act for fulfillment. This person does not have the desire like that coming out of, you know, ignorance of the truth, of one's true nature. 
one knows one's ever fulfilled true nature so the there is no desire for you know, trying to get fulfillment from the world outside now this action is a manifestation of the divinity within i see the oneness in all existence so my heart goes out in love and compassion i said the language of compassion language of love language of service uh, so that that is the uh, sri ramakrishna answered this question very well desire for god is it a desire or not and he said no it's not a desire because it enables you to get out of all desire this is if you call it a desire it's such a desire which destroys all desire it it enables you to escape from the cycle of desire um then his nice example mishri mishtir modde noy so the rock candy sweets they create acidity but this rock candy if you have acidity you drink it with water and that's supposed to be a good antacid so this is not to be counted among a sweet though it tastes sweet so the desire for god is not to be counted as a desire mm how about if he is motivated by cosmic desire true then sudhir is asking does the enlightened person see his own body as an object yes will will clearly see the body as an object the karma i am doing it now is it the result of my prarabdha karma no uh, the karma what comes to me the circumstances of my life are prarabdha karma then how i respond to it is my karma now Girish is saying, "Bill, what about the unenlightened person who is seeking enlightenment?" Yes, so this is about the enlightened person. But what what is the, what's the lesson that we take away from it? So all the characteristics of the enlightened person, which are interesting to understand in themselves anyway, but for us, so these are ways in which we should practice. So whether you are a monk, you should be try try to be a monk like that, or whether you are an uh, enlightened householder, if you are practicing. spiritual disciplines and trying to be enlightened in household life in the midst of family life in the midst of the world should be tried to be like that uh, and what is shown in verses 20 21 22 19 20 21 22 girish is that the enlightened person recognizes that it is brahman but brahman has no will yes okay Gloria says, "What is the point of being in the body for the monk in the Himalayas for attaining enlightenment, or after enlightenment for remaining absorbed in Brahman as long as the body lasts?" See, the question is, I understand that you are an austere monk, ever engaged in prayer and meditation and study and all of that to attain enlightenment. But suppose you have attained enlightenment, why would you continue to be in that body if you have no other action to perform, just feeding the body and keeping it in a cave? true but such a person would not see any sense in destroying the body either see to keep the body and to destroy the body both are signs of being attached to the body um so that person would you know let as swami vivekananda says let karma run it down no more is birth and death for you you've gone you have go thou from place to place and help them out of maya's veil heed no more how body lives or dies so i will make on this uh, own language heed then no more how body lives or dies let karma run it down its task is done let karma run it down the prarabdha karma i have heard swami bhuteshanand ji say uh, many many years this decades ago 1994 he would say very slowly amar um bajbaru ichcha nahi morbaru ichcha nahi I have no specific desire to go on living. He was nearly ninety-eight at, at that time. He was ninety-five and ninety-six. I have no specific desire to go on living. I have no specific desire to die either. Somebody asked him, "How do you see this world? What's going on now?" And he said in Bengali, "Indra jalabut, like a magic show." and how do they have boots or are they walking in sandals oh they have boots otherwise they they would freeze <laughs> the monks who live in the uh, himalayan snows 
But it's tough. One monk told me the story. He lives in a cave. No, he was in a hut. Once in the deep winter, he had a fever. I think he got the flu or some whatever. He had fever. By the way, it's not as unhealthy as you might think. I am not at all used to it. I spent a couple of months there bathing in freezing water uh, every day in the morning. And I didn't catch a cold. Finally, two months later, I returned to Calcutta. I got down in Howrah station and I got a cold. I think the pollution is more responsible for uh, sickness than uh, the cold or physical austerity. Yeah, so this monk told me that he had a fever. And then he had to go to a hosp- to a doctor, but there's no doctor around. The, the nearest village is 26 kilometers away. And um, so there is this police outpost where one or two policemen stay. So one of those policemen said, I will take you to the village and then you can go to a doctor. So how do you do that? With a fever, 101, 102 fever, this monk has to walk in snow, ankle deep or knee deep snow for 26 kilometers. And he says that I started walking and uh, the policeman said, not so close, Swami, stay away because there are gorges here. If one of us falls, uh, the other one also will be dragged down. So you have to stay several paces behind me or ahead of me. You can't stay close to me. And like that, they walked 26 kilometers. I would have preferred to die, I think, rather than do that. What simple living through practice of discipline makes sense. While simple means makes sense, it still appears to be a radical act of courage to depend on the rest of the world for this. No, depend on God, not the rest of the world. There is no rest of the world. And it is a very good practice to see that actually it is God who is taking care of us. Those who are in the world, you think that the world is taking care of you. Not at all. It is God who is taking care of us. With my little experience, I have understood this. Once, um, I was telling you about the 26 kilometers away and I know from personal experience, so this is the occasion to tell the story. I had gone there once for some work from the mountain tops to that village. The village itself is 9,000 feet high and the place I was living is further up, 26 kilometers up. So there's a bus which runs back and forth. I took the bus and this was in the height of summer, so there were people around. So I had to finish my work and then get back to my hut before nightfall. So there was another bus and I went to the road, climb, to climb up to the road up from, from the village. And because I had no place to stay in the village. So I waited for the bus to come back. It was around 4 o'clock, 3.30 or 4 in the afternoon. And it gets very dark very quickly when the sun starts setting in the mountains. And then there were no buses, no vehicles, nothing. I asked the villager, what's wrong? They said, oh, there's been a landslide. And so the vehicles, buses, nothing is going to come now. They're all cut off. Now imagine my condition. I have no place to stay, let alone eat or anything like that. And my, my hut is 26 kilometers up the mountain. I mean, f- further up the mountains. I guess for one of those mountain monks, it won't, won't be. They're like mountain goats. It won't be such a big problem. But for me, it was to walk 26 kilometers uh, through the mountains. Nothing to be done. What, what, what will you do? So I'd, I just designed myself to guard and started walking. Um, I decided I would sleep under a tree, but then it gets freezing cold at night and there are bears and leopards, you know. So I walked and walked and walked and I had to design myself to God. See what happens. There are no human beings around also. Um, And a vehicle came. Uh, It was one of those mountain jeeps. And uh, they stopped and they said, Swami, do you need a lift? I said, yes. Where did you come from? That we were also trapped by the landslide. We could not go back. They were trapped on the wrong side of the landslide. So we decided to come back to Gangotri. And they gave me a lift. But that's dependence on God. What else will you call it? I don't know if I would have... I guess I would have survived, but I don't know. And uh, you let go and depend on God. Some, often I've seen monks, devotees, many of them. There are so many amazing stories of being taken care of. With that in mind, let's just stop. Oh, you ha- had a hand up. Um, Prakyat? If some people have a hand up. Punaji? Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, Swamiji, the general belief is that to act without an eye upon the fruit of our activities is the path of action. So, is this a misunderstanding? Because we are not asked to renounce the fruit. We are only asked to renounce the attachment, not the fruits. Correct. Of any of the path of action yeah. means karma yoga. That is karma yoga. Yeah. So, um, not the result itself. If you are a monk, you, are, you abandon the result also. The action and the result. And in the case of uh, the karma yogi in the world, you abandon your uh, attachment to the result. But you do the action and the result will come of itself uh, because you are doing the action for, it might be for the welfare of others or fighting for the, uh, for the common good. Arjuna, if he fights the battle, a result will come, definitely. So, karma will be done, result will come. But you are not attached to the karma, you are not attached to the result. Why are you doing it then as a spiritual practice for enlightenment? If you are already enlightened, why are you doing it as an expression of uh, your enlightenment? As you feel the oneness in all beings and to, to help them out of compassion or love. All right. Then. Let us end. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu